Hi, I'm Diane Perlman. I'm a uh, producer, uh, media producer, and film producer. I also am the executive director of the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative. We are a nonprofit here in all four Western Mass counties, and we do three things. We create production, workforce, and education opportunities in the film and media industry for, uh, as an economic initiative for the region. Well, what does that mean? It's a big, long mission statement. It means we do classes at our colleges, Hampshire, Berkshire Community Cl uh, College. We're about to do a course here at UMass uh, in Springfield. We teach classes like Get a Grip, How to Be a Grip PA. <laughs> and uh, we also help productions when they come here. So when films come here, we encourage them to hire locally. We want them to use our local caterers and stay in our hotels because it's a big boon for our local economy. So that's what we do. We have a database of locations and crew and we help people. But I'm going to take you on a journey 30, almost 25 years back when I first came here and um, worked with this gentleman, Douglas Trumbull. Most of you probably don't know him, but he actually worked on Close Encounters of a Third Kind, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Blade Runner. He is a visual effects pioneer. And in the 1980s, he was actually out in Hollywood. And he said to all the studios, you know, film runs at, does anybody know what film runs at? 24 frames a second. And Doug said, you know, we can actually enhance the audience experience if we make films go faster, bring the audience closer to what's going on in the picture. And he developed something called ShowScan, ran at 60 frames a second. This is in the 80s, Six, 60 frames a second. And the studio said, forget it, we're not going to do it. Then he said, you know, you can actually take all the content of the movies and make it into theme park rides. Wouldn't that be fabulous? And they said, you're crazy. So Doug said to Hollywood, you're crazy. And he came to the Berkshires. And the first thing he did was one person actually in Hollywood thought that Doug was really talented, and his name was Steven Spielberg. And he called Doug and he said, I like your idea of making entertainment, location-based entertainment. And they did the Back to the Future ride in Housatonic. So part of what we're gonna, you're going to find out today is all the movies that were actually created in Western Mass or had their hands in the technology of movies that went worldwide. So they, they did the Back to the Future ride. It was a big success. If you've ever been to Disney or any place, Universal, you've probably been on a motion base. That, was, that technology happened here. After that, um, Doug was asked to do three attractions for this big hotel in Las Vegas called the Luxor. That's when I came to work with him in 1992. We did another motion base ride. We also did um, a ride that was, was actually not a ride, but it was a 3D simulation. And we also did a projection on a 200 foot screen on something called VistaVision film, which is a larger format that you turn on its side. And that ran at 48 frames a second. 1992, not 2015, 1992. Um, so I want to show you a little bit. So does anybody know where this might be? Does anybody know? It's actually a model. <laughs> so this was the future city that we created scale model, uh, motion control camera right here. This is our stage in Lenox, Massachusetts. 200 people we had there. We had a full model and miniature shop. We had two motion control stages, um, a complete um, computer graphics department. Um, and this, is con this is, works on a, a truss, and it has a telescope lens. And you can't use a real camera, because if you actually used a real camera and you walked it through, they would look about this big. So what you do is you shoot about as quickly as grass grows. You shoot a frame, then you shoot a frame, then you shoot a frame. It takes about six hours. I learned to actually drink beer on a motion control set. <laughs> I did. <laughs> but when you get close and that periscope comes down, this is what it looks like you're traveling through, a futuristic city. And um, I just wanted you to see actually the level of model making that happened here in Western Massachusetts. After um, we delivered the Luxor project, uh, Doug went on to become the chairman of IMAX. And a bunch of us were still in, in the Berkshires. And we said, wow, it's really nice here. Why would I go back to LA or New York? And we started um, a visual effects company called Mass Illusion. And we worked on high-end uh, feature films for six years hiding out in the Berkshires. The first film we worked on was Judge Dredd, the first one. You actually know you're really old when they make a remake of a movie that you made. Um, and so I'm just going to show you some behind the scenes about how we did that. So when you get a movie script, you actually start with storyboards. You hire an art director. They say, OK, this is the shot going into Mega City. And you figure it all out. And the shot at the end looks like this. So 
Here's a model miniature that was created. Uh, this is a computer generated ship. This is a uh, you know, guy that was shot against green screen that was composited. And this is the Berkshires. And what was amazing during this time is we actually uh, utilized uh, something called pre-visualization. So in visual effects before, you had people shooting models, and then somebody would shoot something on a stage, and then um, you, know, you were trying to put some com computer animation, and the poor guy called the compositor, or the woman who had to put it together, was like, they don't match. And it would take hours to try and line things up. Doug Trumbull actually, on the Luxor um, project, developed something called pre-visualization, where you actually um, design the shot in a low resolution animation first, and then you send that telemetry to all the departments. They know, so they know exactly how the camera's gonna go. Didn't sound so complicated, it was kind of brilliant. So that shots start looking like this. This is the police hall in Judge Dredd. So we build it first, the director goes, yeah, I like that shot. And then when you have to put all the pieces together, it's easy or easier. So there's the model, there's computer animation, there's a practical explosion that happens. And it goes together quite well. These are also the drawings for the scale model of Mega City that we made. So that's what the city looked like. We shot at Shepard in Studios, and the, they can only build to 25 feet, but Mega City was huge. So we actually had to make the models that go on top of the set in London. So that's what looked, this looked like. Halfway through the movie, they decided that the movie was boring. And they said, we want to do a flying motorcycle sequence. And I said, what? And they said, you have to do a flying motorcycle sequence. Put Stallone and Rob on a motorcycle and fly him through the city. Well, luckily, we had built the models at the right scale to do that. And we did pre-visualization. So here um, would be Stallone and Rob on the motorcycle. Luckily, the guys from the Back to the Future ride worked on this. So we knew how to do a motion base. So this is the pre-visualization, what it's going to look like in 3D. And there they are on the rig at Shepperton Studios, 15 feet up in the air against a green screen. And actually, for a couple of shots, um, Kleiser Walsack Construction Company, our um, CGI company, had to make a fake Stallone because you can't really fly him through fire. He doesn't really like that. <laughs> so, and this is the end shot. So that's what it looks like. And the last bit of technology that was developed, actually, this is the set at Shepperton looking down. That's what it looked like at night. That's what it looked like with the models that we put on it. And that's what it looked like with the models and computer-generated imagery. It was the first time, I think, ever that three layers had actually been put on in one shot. That's the end shot of the movie, um, where Stallone drives his motorcycle out. Next, we also went on to work on movies like Die Hard with a Vengeance, Eraser, Evita. We were hiding out in the Berkshires. I was young. We had a big studio. I had 200 people working for me and lots of equipment. But now, actually, after 25 years, we're kind of coming out of behind our computers. What dreams may come? Um, so this was really difficult because they wanted to create something called the painted world. So in the painted world, um, the story very quickly is Robin Williams actually is killed in a car accident. And he goes to what is his heaven, which is his wife's paintings. And she kills herself and goes to hell. And the story is him going through all these worlds to save her. It's a beautiful movie if you've never seen it. So here's the set in Alameda, California. Um, it's against a blue screen, beautifully designed by Eugenio Zanetti. Um, Cuba Good Gooding Jr. is there. And how do we make this into a painting? Really difficult. We use something called LIDAR technology, which is a laser surveying tool similar to this. So you go to the set and you, you map all these points, point, 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 and you basically create that set in 360 degrees. And that allowed us to have a, a space to actually put the painting onto. We hired Stephen Hannock, who's a painter in Williamstown. He came in and painted some brush strokes for us, and we scanned them, 1996, not 2016. We scanned them into the computer and created that. Um, so this was the painted world. And what was interesting about it is it actually had to match. When Robin Williams walked through the set and had painting on him, it had to feel the same as what we were creating. Here's um, on the set in Montana with flowers, and that's what it looked like with Robin Williams in it. And that's what it looked like with Cuba Gooding Jr. on the lake. So this was a great project. In the middle of it, we got a call actually by the Wachowskis to work on another project, a little movie called The Matrix. And um, here's the thing in visual effects. Here's what I always would get as, as the producer. 
can you create something that's never been seen before? But we only have this much money. So you put everybody in a room and you kind of figure it out. And they wanted to change and alter time and space in a way that had never been seen on movies before. And we created something called Bullet Time. Is there anybody in here who has not seen The Matrix? OK. So all right, you're going to have to go see it after this. So in the, remember, we had just figured out how to create a room or a space in 360 degrees. Now we had to figure out how to take the person in the middle of the shot and have it be in a different time. That was our bid sheet. Remember that one where he falls back? That's what we did. Here's the rig. So the bullet time rig looks like this. It is um, still cameras on a flexible rig that can move in any way that the Wachowski brothers wanted the shot to be. And all of the cameras are facing inside. And then there also were usually two film cameras running at the same time. This is Rodney uh, Iwashina. He's checking the cameras. So you put Keanu in the middle. And actually, in this shot, it's already been taking. The rigging has already been taking. But you put those cameras all around him, and they fire like this. Right? So you have that information. And we have, ha, uh, have interpolation software whoops, that actually um, can take the two images between the two still cameras and figure it out. So all of a sudden, you had a camera going around Keanu Reeves. You had the outside that we could create separately. And you could actually manipulate the time and space of the outside of the frame and the inside of the frame. And that's how that shot was done. Same for all of the other sequences. You can see the rigging here, the bullet time rig. In most of the shots, all of the scenes were shot, but then mapped together. We also created the CGI elements um, of the Sentinel and uh, there are John and Joel, our visual effects supervisors, winning the Academy Award. John won for The Matrix. Joel and another gentleman, Nick Brooks, won for um, What Dreams May Come. But it was 1998. We got bought. We had offices in Alameda, and we had offices in Lenox. And somebody came in and said, we like what you do. I promised to keep both studios open, and then moved it all to California. So about 50 people left, and a bunch of us stayed. So the truth is, we have quite a robust film community in Western Mass. There are now three visual effects companies, Synthespian Studios, Cadence Effects, and Sandbox Effects. They've designed the Columbia logo, worked on Stargate, Clear and Present, Danger, Narnia, Lord of the Rings. You can see all the movies they've worked on. Most recently, Hunger Games, Game of Thrones, Creed. These are not 200-person studios anymore. I would never do that. These are guys sitting in their living room in Pittsfield with a workstation with three of their friends. So what's interesting in this discussion is what really is the film industry here? The visual effects industry is moving along. But I also just had the incredible opportunity to work with Karen Allen, who is probably best known as Indiana Jones's girlfriend, drank him under the table in the first movie. Um, she was also in Starman and Sandlot and is now starring in A Year by the Sea, actually, um, an independent film. Karen lives in the Berkshires, and she said, you know, I've directed a lot of theater. I've been in 45 films. I want to direct a movie. I said, great. So we just finished shooting in June a 30-minute film based on a Carson McCullers story called A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud. And the reason I bring this up is we're also, also altering time and space when we go into a movie set. So this movie takes place in 1947. It's being shot in black and white. And we turned this little bar in Santa's Field into a diner in 1947. So I started to think about this whole industry, really. It isn't just about visual effects. It's not just about feature films, a couple of which have been shot here. The Judge and Labor Day were shot in Shelburne Falls. But there are a lot of filmmakers here, like Cynthia Wade, who won the Oscar for Freeheld that was then made into a feature film, and Diego Angaro, who shot Bob in the Trees in Santa's Field and has been at Sundance and has won awards around the world. So what does this mean for our film industry? We actually have a robust industry here. We, we have tons of people here. So what is the future of, of the industry here? Well, it's actually quite exciting. So when I mentioned Berkshire Film and Media before, we do a lot of things. We actually network people. Because one of the things we want to do is, if you need to make a video, why are you going to LA or New York when you have Academy Award winners down the street? So we start doing networking events. And about three years ago, we actually started doing something called the exchange for our filmmakers and our businesses to work together. Because our business needs need video. 
They just do. It used to be take your beige website and put pictures on it. And now it's take that website and put video on it. And if I said to most of you, hey, let's make a video, you'd be like, no, no. right? Because it's expensive and it's difficult, but it really isn't. Actually, later this month, we're having a conference just for nonprofits and small businesses to learn how to use video. Because our feeling is that this is something that everybody should know. Everybody should know how to be video literate. Everybody should know how to make a video. Because our kids do. <laughs> they take out their phones, they're, on, you know, they're shooting stuff all the time. Not us. But it actually isn't that difficult. And it's not that overwhelming. And really, if we keep the industry building, we will create jobs here. Because people hire other people. And we have filmmakers here that go around the world and shoot, but they'd rather shoot at home. They would rather be here and give their time to a nonprofit to, for a message that's going to help them tell their story and get more donors. So it creates jobs. We actually did a study two years ago. For every dollar that is spent on a film, 60 cents goes into our local economy. Now, it may not sound like much. But on a small film that's $100,000, that's $60,000 going into Lee or Holyoke or Greenfield or Springfield. And think of a movie like, Judge, like um, The Judge that was millions and millions of dollars. It's a lot of money here. It's also pretty clean. We don't have to build anything. They come in. They pay for things. They use our restaurants they, and everything. And it's really a great boon for our economy. Also encourages our young people to stay here. People want, uh, young people want an industry they can work in. So that's one of the reasons we're looking to expand the industry. And the other thing is, it increases tourism. People want to go where movies are shot. They want to know where Robert Downey Jr. had his cup of coffee in the morning. They really do. So all of these are our way of building the industry. And just to go back to Doug, the first guy I talked about, he's still here. He's got two green screen stages in the Berkshires. He just shot a film called Ufotog at 120 frames per second, 3D, 4,000 line resolution. He is still doing it. And it's called the Magi Process. And actually, Hollywood's finally listening. There's a movie coming out, being debuted, I think, next week at the New York Film Festival called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk by Sony. Ang Lee is the director. He's using Doug's technology. So the technology that has been developed here in Western Mass is still permeating the industry. And we're really proud about that. And we want to continue that. And as Doug says, for the last 20 years, I've been able to enjoy the beauty of the Berkshires and continue my high tech creative work on projects via the internet. A combination of nature, local talent, and technology offers a quality of life that's unsurpassed. The truth about how a lot of this technology got done or why it's so innovative, nobody was looking down our, over our shoulders when we were doing it. No one was saying, here, come work here, come work here. We were the only game in town. And you had a technical problem, you went for a walk. You went for a hike. Took the afternoon off and took a drive around the mountains. And that's how technology got developed. And we think this is an industry that we can continue to grow and build here. And so I invite you guys to make a video. Thank you. <laughs>